Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Our topic today is turning information into insights. And this is part of our ongoing research on maximizing the value of medical affairs activities and communicating that value to, to all of our stakeholders, both internal and external to the company. We've got two great speakers today, and I'm excited to introduce them to you in just a moment. Uh, I do want to take a moment and discuss the ACMA's role in advocating for medical affairs. Most of you who are familiar with the ACMA know us from our work in building the world's first and only accredited medical certification program for medical affairs professionals. Um, over the last five years, we've worked with thousands of professionals in over 50 countries to test and certify their medical affairs skills. And we've worked to set the global standard for medical affairs skills and professional ethics. From that work, we came to understand that medical affairs teams need their own tools dedicated to medical affairs work and not just adapted from other functional tools. ACMA Engage is our new medical affairs CRM platform. Engage was built from the ground up for medical affairs. It's easy to use, easy to administer, and it reflects the workflows of field medical, medical information, medical communications, and medical affairs management. ACMA Predict is our new predictive analytics platform. It uses our proprietary machine learning system to go beyond sentiment analysis and instead gives you actionable predictions of your key opinion leaders, future needs and preferences. Engage and predict are two parts of our growing suite of medical affairs services. If you're interested, please be in touch with us after the webinar. With that in mind, uh, I want to, with, with that I want to welcome to these uh, speakers. Uh, Monica Gottam is Managing Director of Compass Medical Affairs Consulting. Monica is a pharmacist with 25 years of quite diverse experience in clinical practice, the pharmaceutical industry, academia, and consulting. She spent over 15 years at Amgen Canada, where she was a senior executive and led the scientific affairs and patient support functions. She founded Compass Medical Affairs Consulting in 2017 and Medical Affairs Canada in 2019, and now works with organizations to uncover and solve complex problems and develop highly valued medical affairs teams. She's passionate about education and shares her knowledge and experience with future healthcare leaders by teaching courses in management and the pharmaceutical industry at the Doctor of Pharmacy program at the University of Toronto. Tafik Chowdhury is Managing Director of Traction Strategic Partners. He, uh, he founded Traction in 2008, and over the last 12 years, Traction has provided strategic marketing support and services to many pharmaceutical brands in Canada, the United States, and Europe. After completing a hospital pharmacy residency at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, Tafik began his career as a clinical pharmacist. His move to the pharmaceutical industry began in medical affairs as a medical information specialist at AstraZeneca for CNS products. He then moved into various sales and marketing roles at AstraZeneca, Amgen, and Wyeth. Tafik is an out-of-the-box thinker. With his extensive experience in the public healthcare system, as well as in the pharmaceutical industry, he's able to provide creative solutions to unusual problems. His passion for education leads him to teach wherever he can, from a basketball court to patient education forums. With that, I welcome Monica and Tafik. Thank you, Adam. All right. Well, thank you, Adam, for that very kind introduction. Uh, Tafik and I are co-founders of Medical Affairs Canada, and we're really excited to be with you here today on ACMA's webinar. And we're going to go with, there's a lot of been talked about around medical affairs and insights. And today we want to go back to the basics, make sure that we have a common understanding of the terminology and being very practical. And uh, hopefully some of this information will help the team maximize uh, their team's efforts. So what we're hoping to cover off today is, if we can go to the next slide, um, is really to, to 
get it into a bit of terminology and differentiate terms like data, information, and insights. We'll then talk about some best practices to effectively communicate insights. And then Tafik will spend some time around the collection of insights and how to best leverage the customer relationship management systems and touch on some general principles around compliance guidance and what to look for. What are the features you wanna look for in a CRM specifically for medical affairs professionals? So we'll just jump in and talk about insights. I think we can all agree that gathering insights is a critical responsibility for MSLs. Um, it's just one of their many tasks. And in fact, it's truly the result of the collective efforts that an MSL is responsible for. But what exactly does it mean? And if we look at the definition, it's the act or the result of apprehending the inner nature of, of things or seeing things intuitively. And I read that in that definition and I think it can, it, it doesn't really add a whole lot of clarity in terms of what does that mean for me and my job, whether I'm an MSL um, or even an MSL manager. An MSL may not understand what is really the most value. What, what am I uncovering that's of the greatest value for internal stakeholders? And similarly, I remember being an MSL manager and I would get reams and reams of reports and trying to discern from that wave of or sea of words what exactly is truly important. And I think both groups can sometimes struggle with this activity. So as I said earlier, we're going to today Go back to the basics, align on some terminology, share some best practices, and recognize that when it comes to insights, the onus is both on the manager to set clear expectations and direction, as well as the MSL to clearly uh, communicate the insights that they glean from the work in their field. So if we go to the next slide and talk about what insights are, sometimes the best way to do this is by communicating what they are not. So we talk a lot about data. Data is absolutely critical, but it's simply a starting point. It doesn't do the thinking for you. And you must analyze data from multiple points of view. I, I have can recall many times, and I'm guilty of it myself, where you find a really fascinating piece of, uh, of data and you, you get attached to it. And it's really important not to get so attached, to maintain some objectivity and look for validation and disconfirming information from multiple sources. Insights are also not observations. Observations are absolutely important, but what they lack is the why. Why, is, why am I seeing what I'm seeing? So you can really treat that like another data point, if you will. And finally, customer opinions. Those are critically important, but I wish insight gathering was that simple. It, and it isn't. You have to dig deeper. You have to understand what's that motivation behind it and, and behind um, that customer's opinion. What is they're looking, what are they looking for? So while data observations and opinions are very important, it shouldn't be confused as being an insight unto itself. So if we go to the next slide and we think about, we spend so much time about insights in medical affairs, does it even matter? And the short answer to that is absolutely it matters. Never before have companies, pharma being one, but every, in every industry, access to data has never been like, it's, like it is today. And there's the volumes and volumes of that data. What we do know from research is understanding that data um, and turning them into insights can actually lead to much better business decisions. And if you do it with the strategic perspective and being, um, well, I should say great insights. So good insights lead to better business decisions. Great insights can actually be a competitive advantage for your company, putting you ahead of your competitor. It might be because you choose to act on something that you uh, identify in the field ahead of your competitors. So don't underestimate the value of insights. And finally, if you are reliable in terms of bringing forward insights of great value, you will be seen as a very important strategic partner amongst other groups within your organization. I can't stress enough that it's the quality that matters when it comes to insights, not the quantity. It's not a competition. As competitive as I am, this is where quality is what you want to be measured on. And that's what truly matters. 
And if you look on the right side of, of this, of this uh, slide, you can see the data pyramid in that there is an awful lot of data that's, that is uncovered, but it's really the tip of this iceberg, the insights that are just really the, the tip of all of the data and information that is out there, and only a certain fraction of that would actually be actionable. So the next slide shows a diagram that I like to use a lot to just describe what I'm talking about because I'm throwing around a lot of terms. But if we look at this particular picture, you see data. And if you go to the first animation on here, just shows that data is raw, unprocessed facts. You know, they can be quantitative, meaning they can be measured or they could be qualitative in that they've been observed in some fashion. And they're just not organized in any fashion. Think of it like a spreadsheet or a database. And if you go to the next part of information, this is where data has been organized in some way and they've been lumped together. Think of it as a chart or a report or perhaps a dashboard. Now you're starting to, to organize it in some fashion. But it's when you go to the next part of knowledge and insight, knowledge is where over time you're starting to able to connect these dots. And insight is when you can seemingly connect two points that are seemingly disparate, but actually have a connection. And that can only be discerned over time by analyzing multiple pieces of different data and information. But what's most important here is understanding the context and applying your own knowledge to draw some relevant conclusions. And finally, the wisdom, or what I would like to say is the action, the so what of that insight is, figuring out how you navigate through this process and what change or action is required to get you from, from point A to point B. The next slide is just trying to take, sometimes I find it easier to just remove yourself from the industry that we're in and look to something very practical to apply some of these concepts. So I'd imagine that many of us have a Fitbit or some sort of um, device to track our steps. So if you see the number, you know, just under 7,500 steps, that's just raw data. On its own, I have no idea what that means. But it's not until we go to the next where we look at the information, where we get some more context and meaning. So if you think about, say, in a Fitbit chart where you have some of these graphs, and if you look at this graph, and hopefully you can see it, but what you can discern from some of this is that there's a, a 10,000 step line. So that would maybe indicate that's the, the daily step goal. You have the time of day that's there. You can see in the last few days that step goal was not achieved, but it was achieved maybe last week. What does this really mean? If you apply the next around the insight from this particular information is, you know, if my goal is 10,000 steps, I gotta, got to um, travel 2,500 more steps roughly in the next five hours to achieve that goal. And then finally, the action around this or the wisdom is, to get moving and that's the next step. But what's not clear here, and this might be what we all naturally will come to in terms of a conclusion, but what isn't known here is my own knowledge. And this is where an MSL, especially in the field or any medical affairs professional, it's that application of their own knowledge. Perhaps if this is my situation, maybe I was on vacation last week and was on a sight sightseeing tour and that accounted for getting over my 10,000 steps. Or perhaps today I'm really sick and I know that I'm not going to be able to get out of bed. So even though it's only 2,500 more steps, I, I know I'm not going to achieve that. So don't dismiss the importance of your own knowledge and experience of the situation to help shape the insight and the recommended action that goes with it. Also note that not all insights that you will uncover will be actionable, nor do they have to be. They can still be of value. And the next slide really just is a summary to show the, the framework that's in place that outlines what I've just spoken about. We've talked about going from data to information to insights. Recognize that this is a time intensive process. It's also an iterative process. And it starts, however, with direction and strategic thinking. It's critically important for MSL managers or medical affairs leaders to ensure that MSLs have the appropriate direction, that they know what are the key questions to ask of their customers 
that they understand the strategy, the medical strategy, as well as the brand strategy, that they are aware of what the knowledge gaps might be and what they need, how they can actually add value to that, that process. So that's onus is somewhat on um, the management and as well as on the MSL themselves. I've seen some companies that have gone so far um, as to formalize this process and establish key intelligence topics and key intelligence questions that they provide to the MSL so to ensure that they can help prioritize some of their insights and, and their activities. It also comes to strategic thinking. We could spend a whole hour on strategic thinking in this process, but it's really the, the approach, the types of questions, knowing what questions to ask of which physicians or customers and at what time to get to the insights that are going to be of value and recognizing that this is a timely process. But it's also imperative to share those insights with the appropriate people. And what underpins this whole process is the compliance factor. This has to be done in a, in a, with upholding all compliance standards. And that's where Tafik will touch on at the end. But keep in mind that the most powerful insights come from that rigorous analysis to an analyze large amounts of data and information to achieve those concise, compelling findings. And it sounds easy, but it's a very complex process. So some tips to keep in mind when we're gathering insights is I find that MSLs at time, they may not be maybe unsure of what should they share, or they may think, well, this the head office team might already know this and they may choose to not share some very important information and insights. And they may miss an opportunity if they choose not to share. Or conversely, they provide all of the information and insights that they've gleaned, making it virtually impossible for the recipient or the reader, usually it's the manager, to identify what is the insight in this wave of, of uh, words and information that the, that's in that report. So as an MSL, some things to keep in mind, ask yourself, have I uncovered with when you've uncovered something? Is this new? Does it fill a br or bridge a knowledge gap? Will it lead to a new or a refined strategy? And will it impact research or even clinical practice? And if the answer to any of those questions is yes, that'll help to prioritize which insights should be shared or further formulated and how urgently that they should be shared with the relevant parties. Um, is this something that can wait to a monthly report or should it be escalated uh, in an ad hoc fashion more urgently? The next slide we'll talk about, we mentioned about um, actionable, insights, actionable insights being that gold standard. And while it is that ideal goal of insights um, is to affect some change, you have to make sure that the reader of your insights is going to be inspired to act. And some ways that you can ensure that the desired action is taken is by following these six strategies. One is to make sure that it's aligned to the strategic plan, medical plan, brand plan, and the related performance indicators to that plan. If you want the decision maker to act, it has to be relevant for them. MSLs are critical to this process, but often they're not the decision maker when refining or changing strategy. Sometimes they can within their own territory or within a certain scope. But if this is something that is of broader than that, you want to make sure that the insight is worded in a way that's relevant for that decision maker. If you follow the principles previously talked about, if it's new or validates an assumption, that will help again to ensure the desired action is, is taken. You also want to make sure that the writing of the of the insight is in fact detailed enough that it's not going to result in a lot of back and forth, meaning the decision maker going back to the MSL to ask for more detail or clarification and and that back and forth resulting in unnecessary delay. You also want to be timely and that speaks to making sure that you're escalating the appropriate insights in a to the right people at the right time. If you wait too long, perhaps that you have lost the opportunity to seize, um, to make a change uh, in that moment. And this is where if you've waited a month, for example, or two months or quarter, whatever that time frame may be, you may have actually 
shift, the context of the environment might have shifted, making that insight not as relevant in today's moment. And while you want to provide enough detail, you want to make sure that you're clear and concise enough that the reader knows what you actually want to do and that your, your message is received well and that the appropriate action is taken. So the next is really, how do I do all this? If you've now understand the difference between data, information, and insights, and we recognize that communicating the insights is critically important, how do you do it? How do you be clear and succinct, but making sure that your, your insight is appropriately um, done? And I, I find that this, it's called a three-step approach, but I look at it as three phrases. And if you word your insights to your management, be it your MSL manager or to senior executives in an organization, this is a, a way to perhaps look at it. We know that documenting insights is critically important because we want to look at trends over time, we want to be able to discern regional differences. Um, but this is the three phrase approach that I want you to think about. First is setting the stage. You want to describe what is that current situation and the customer's behavior. It doesn't have to be detailed, overly detailed, but a brief outline of what that situation is. What are the opinions? Of course, make sure to clarify what, who you're talking to, who's the customer. Next in this process is to, to describe what is the issue and what is the why? What's the driver behind this? Um, so what's the problem? Are there any barriers? What's the emotion expressed? Powerful insights are often coupled with very strong emotions. So that's a, a bit of a hint in terms of when you're talking with your customers is to look for that emotion and that passion. And then ask yourself, what's driving that behavior? And then finally is, what is ideal state? So what's that motivation? What's behind that, 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 that behavior? But also understanding what would that customer want or what is the ideal state? Um, I'm using customer, but you can change this to a situation or, or whatever makes sense for, for the, the circumstance that you're in. But try to understand what are the frustrations, how do you remove the barrier, and um, what is that desired outcome. You don't always have to state the solution or the action that needs to happen. You just may want to describe what ideal state could look like. Because as an MSL, you may not have all of the information to, um, to fairly and objectively state what should happen, but that you do know that some desired state needs to have needs to be in place. So I strongly encourage you to just think about this three phrase approach when you're writing the insights in your reports. Um, you know, set the stage, state the problem and the motion that's driving it, and why, what does ideal state look like? And I think that if you keep these in mind, it'll help you more clearly articulate not only insights, but the value of medical affairs to your cross-functional stakeholders. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Tafik to, to cover off the second part of today's webinar. Thank you, Monica. So I'm going to take uh, the next uh, 10 minutes or so to talk about um, CRMs. I know some of you guys are probably already using a customer relationship management system or tool uh, in your organizations, but um, let's have a look at uh, what these mean to an organization. So as Monica sort of went through, really the reasons that we want to uncover customer insights, it's really to uh, attempt to align our customer needs with our company's business goals. And the better we do this, uh, the more successful we will be as an organization and, and for our own business itself. So what sources of information uh, or data uh, do we get or where, where do we collect our data from? Now, traditionally, uh, most of the data has come from market research, and this might be qualitative or quantitative market research. Um, but there are other sources of information. You can get it from sales data, uh, focus groups, uh, advisory board meetings. Um, so there's multiple sources of information that, and data uh, collection that we have, but the bulk of the data that we get on a day-to-day -day basis is the interactions that we have with our customers. And where we generally tend to put that information is usually into a customer relationship management system if we have that available 
uh, for others who are a little bit more old school and might go into an Excel spreadsheet. It might be cue cards, which some of my uh, colleagues in sales have been doing for, for decades. Um, but there has to be a, a place where that information can go and where it can be analyzed. So if we have a CRM available, then the data goes into the customer relationship management system. We take all the data points that we have for market research and others, and then we come up with these insights and, and Monica showed us how you know, we, we do come up with those insights. So if we go to the next slide, so why is it important to have a CRM? Five, five different reasons. So one is to connect with our customers, and, and I'll go through in a little bit more detail as to what that means. Secondly, it allows the organization to grow in an efficient manner. Third, it allows us to uncover new insights and hopefully better insights as our knowledge and our wisdoms grow. And as we're sort of living through the pandemic now, uh, we kind of realized being able to do business anywhere is an important function uh, that we need to have. And then finally, the CRM allows protection of the business, um, both in the immediate and in, in the future. So next slide. Okay. So the main reason or the main purpose of having a CRM is really to support us engaging our customers. And what I mean by that is our customers are our, our most important assets. And we want to create a single truth about the relationship that we have with each one of our customers. So if you take a KOL or if you take a, a customer or client uh, in medical affairs, is it the same truth about that patient? Why is that, is that customer important to your business? And is it the same across all functional areas? So the KOL for medical affairs, does that single truth or the importance of that customer, is it the same for medical affairs as it is for sales, as it is for marketing? If not, then how do we communicate that single truth across all of the functional areas? And then are we then meeting their needs um, in a succinct and in a cohesive manner? The CRM also allows us to identify which are our most valuable accounts. So in terms of effort allocation, um, we can now spend the most amount of time, energy, and resources uh, to the accounts that offer the best return on investment for our business. And if you look at the services that we're going to provide, then we want to be able to identify those accounts uh, that are going to be the ones that bring the, the most return. From a, from a cross-functional opportunity um, management and campaign integration, well, what I mean there is really, um, there are always opportunities that have come up from whether it's a KOL or whether it's an institution, and that one the opportunity might come up with Medical, it might come up with sales, it might come up with marketing, but is that communicated across all of the, the three different functional areas? If not, then the CRM really allows us to communicate across those functional areas and then be able to really capture those opportunities in a timely manner. And then once we do have and sort of an actionable item uh, and we have a campaign, then we can integrate those campaigns across all of the different, uh, different functional areas. Next slide. So the second thing that the, the CRM really allows us to do is to grow our business in an efficient manner. So the ability to be able to align people and business processes, well, without a, a, a good amount of data and um, knowledge gained from that, uh, we really can't grow in an efficient manner and scale up. Now, this becomes more important and, and 
smaller organizations are sort of moving from a small organization to a medium organization or from a medium to a larger, as you get more people, as you get more, then you get more data and to be able to analyze that data, get those insights and to be able to grow and grow in an efficient manner is, is important. We've all seen a lot of small companies uh, that have had difficulty um, as they sort of grow into a medium-sized organization to be able to manage some of the, the people and as the processes that they have um, as, as, as they sort of grow. Next slide. So Monica sort of talked about this earlier and we have a lot of data points. We have a lot of data, we have a lot of information, and this information goes into our customer relationship management tool. And it's really the foundation. This is the, the raw materials, if you will, um, for gaining new insights. But at the end of the day, it's not really a solution. And again, Monica talked a little bit about those. And you know, once you have an insight, you then have to have an act, which one of these are actionable insights. Um, and then after that is which ones are you then going to execute of those actionable insights that you've uncovered. Um, so the, the CRM and the data within the CRM is really just the, the starting point. But what it allows you to do is really to have, you know, it, it allows you to make those timely and well-informed decisions. And the better uh, that you can do that, um, the better the organization looks from a perspective of a customer, the organization, if they can make those decisions in a timely manner, looks much more agile, looks a lot more responsive to the needs of the, of the customers. And then finally for uh, new insights, it really removes that reliance on the gut feel decisions. Now, you know, we've, we've all had those, and, and, and I'm a little bit old school in that the gut feel, and maybe that's, that's the wrong terminology, is still has, there's that wisdom that goes into that. So you have to have the data to be able to uh, make sort of the, the insights, but then the wisdom that you've built about that client, about that customer, about that institution, uh, really... Uh, plays a role as well. So if you go back to Monica's example of the, the number of steps, the situation might have been that, you know, she's not feeling well, but, and that's sort of going to account for uh, the, the missteps for that day. Well, in the same situation, um, in uh, an institution, they might be going through some organizational changes. Uh, there might be a new, a new, uh, computer system that's coming in that's, that's affecting the, the flow of work at, the, at that institution. And that might be the reason why you're not able to see the clients or you're not able to uh, get access to certain you know, resources within that institution. So all of that does play a role in terms of uh, get, creating those uh, new insights. Now we're all sort of living this uh, you know, right now as we're going through the, uh, the pandemic. But the ability to have apps, a web portal, offline access on our, on our laptops, this really allows a CRM, and most CRMs have these functionalities um, right now, but it really empowers staff to get work done regardless of where they are, whether they're in country or out, outside of the country, but you can now work pretty much uh, remotely with these, uh, with these systems. And again, going back to responsiveness, the ability to connect on demand, to have access uh, to the CRM, regardless of where you are, really from a, from a customer perspective, it looks like you're being very responsive to their needs um, because you can respond to their requests, you can react to new leads that are coming up and you can manage the existing accounts that uh, currently you have. Next slide. And in terms of protecting the business, employees are, are constantly, you know, moving from one organization to another. 
and the the data the information that they've created or, or established during their time at that uh, at that organization in in past has been lost as soon as they've uh, they've left but with a, a good crm that information still resides within that organization so it's it's not lost you can also control um the security of uh, of the data so only certain certain uh, individuals or certain functionalities have access to the data as opposed to others. And then for those or those CRNs that are cloud-based, um, the backup happens sometimes on demand. So as, as you're making the changes, uh, those, uh, those occur, and therefore the, it minimizes the loss of data uh, that may happen in, in previous uh, situations. Next slide. So when we're looking at from a compliance perspective or, you know, what are the best practices for when you're entering data into a, into a CRM? These are a few points to, to sort of keep in mind. So one is you, you want to maintain that high ethical professional scientific standards. So the information that's going in there really should be, you know, coming from a legitimate, reliable sources. Um, you don't want to put, you know, rumors or, uh, you know, things you've heard secondhand, third hand, but it should be somehow, you know, it should be very, uh, very, very ethical, very professional, and from a scientific perspective. Um, at the end of the day, your words matter, and the information that's going into this CRM is going to be reside there for uh, for a long, long time, um, and you don't want to necessarily have something in there that you can't back up in the future. And when you do share your insights on on the CRM, you know, make sure that you're you're thoughtful in terms of sharing those those insights. Um, understand who is going to be seeing this data, and how is that data and how is that information or how is that statement going to um, going to be perceived by the reader all right next slide and then finally what what should you look for for those who haven't uh, used a CRM uh, as of yet or are looking to to change uh, CRMs what should you be looking for in a customer relationship management system or, or a tool? Well, one, it should be simple and user-friendly. It should incorporate artificial intelligence. And again, with the information, the data that's going in there, it should learn, it should become more, the, those insights should become more robust as more data is being put into it. So it should have a good uh, AI component to it. Obviously, in this day and age, uh, it needs to be cloud-based, um, meaning that you can have access to the CRM uh, regardless of where you are. It should have multiple platforms, whether that's an, an application, an app, um, access through a web portal, um, which would allow it to be accessed by your mobile phone, by uh, an iPad, or a tablet, um, and of course, uh, through your computer. And then finally, it should integrate with other CRMs. Like there are many organizations where medical affairs will have one CRM, sales may have a, a second, marketing may have a third, or sales and marketing have one, and, and medical has um, another one. And how well do those two systems communicate with each other? And in most institutions, they do, they do sort of talk. Um, however, how well and how well is that information shared with each other uh, is uh, still, in my opinion, unknown. So Monica and I did have a chance to uh, review uh, a demo for the ACMA Engage uh, CRM. And uh, we have to say they definitely meet all of these uh, criteria, but if you haven't had a chance to, to see it yet, 
um, I would definitely talk to uh, to Adam about setting up a, a demo uh, because having one that's built from a medical affairs perspective is definitely um, definitely important. Um, but I think it's integration with uh, both sales and, and marketing um, programs well will make it uh, invaluable. So on that note, um, I think I will end it there and uh, hand it out back to Adam. Thank you, Tafik. I, I appreciate that. Um, and as you say, we're very happy to provide demos uh, for ACMA Engage. Uh, we're very excited about the uh, reception uh, that we've gotten so far and uh, look forward to talking with, uh, with more people about it. Um, first question uh, that's come in, uh, is uh, would there be compliance issue if sales and marketing could see the insights that are about off-label and research information? So I, I mean, I can take that and comment on, on that. I mean, absolutely. Uh, every company will have different um, guidelines with respect to sharing of insights across different functions. I think it's pretty standard practice, especially if it's related to off-label or emerging data um, research activities that medical affairs are going to be involved with, that that wouldn't be appropriate to share with sales um, and marketing. I think when Tafik made a comment to this point, it was really more, the more senior you are in an organization, um, Maybe it's the executive committee that's privy to some of that information to make more broader company-wide strategic choices. And so that's where, when, when we were talking a little bit about some best practices on compliance, being very thoughtful as to who needs that information and who you want to share with it. So I, I see ACMA's response to the panelists. Absolutely, you want to be very mindful of what you're sharing and with whom. Great. Uh, and next, next question um, is it's a specific situation. Uh, somebody in their organization, they have difficulty getting a complete view of each KOL. Um, their, the CRM that they're using doesn't provide for kind of a single view of all the different interactions with a KOL. Um, is, and I guess this, this somewhat goes back to the compliance question uh, between the sales and marketing side of the business and medical side of the business. Um, how do you manage that ideally um, in your CRM or through, through other communication tools um, so that everybody understands what the healthcare providers or the KOLs experience is? I, I'm looking at that question. I'm wondering if it's, if, if that's, the question I, I kind of reading it and thinking it might be if I'm an MSL and I have one physician and I've get, um, logged numerous insights against that one physician, is there an easy way within a CRM to see my insights that I derived against that one individual? Right. Right. So that I think I'm, I mean, that would be ideal state. I have yet to see, um, I haven't seen a CRM and maybe Adam, you can comment as to whether ACMA engage actually allows that functionality. Um, I know some of the CRMs that I'm more familiar with from using day to day does not have that, that feature or certainly didn't when I was in that role. Right. And I want to attest to the fact that this is not a uh, set up question. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, we, we have a real person asking it. So. Yeah. So that, this is definitely a feature that ACM Engage has um, where each, you know, you have the perspective of, you know, all the KOLs that an MSL is working with, all the KOLs that a medical affairs team member may be interacting with, but you can also look at the individual KOL and see, you know, past activities, upcoming activities, um, the insights that have been, you know, that, that, particular KOL has produced. Um, it's a, it's a kind of a complete picture of the KOL. Um, and I think that's one of the things that sets ACMA Engage apart um, is that you can have that view uh, both in the field and, uh, and at the management level as well. So I think just, just to sort of go back to the, that, that issue is who, who can, who can actually see it. Um, and going back to the, the idea of that single truth about a, about a customer, about a KOL, um, 
you know, I, I've been out in the field on from a sales perspective, and it was always enlightening to me whenever I met with my medical counterpart for that territory, because they would have completely and sometimes completely different insights about that customer than than I did. And it was a shame. And I always felt it was a shame that there wasn't more or at least that that information that they had wasn't somehow analyzed with the information that I was putting into my CRM. And I think that's where I guess the next evolution or the next uh, step for, you know, for a CRM. And then, and again, not to, not to plug the, the engage, but I think you guys are making that step uh, towards that. And I think that's going to be important moving forward. Yeah. I think that the, um, the calendaring capability within your uh, whatever CRM you're using, but it happens to be that in ACMA Engage, the calendaring function is a bridge that allows for a 360 degree view of the KOL's uh, interactions with, uh, the, with the company um, so that there's a, there's a clear line between kind of off-label and research conversation and that's you know, contained within information that's available to, to an MSL or to a medical affairs team member. Um, and the uh, sales rep or, or somebody doing a marketing analyst can see all the interactions, but not see that kind of off-label work and not, you know, not take action on the off-label uh, request for information or anything like that. Uh, next, next question I, I think is, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, take it as uh, are these systems kind of globally applicable? Are, are there different needs in different parts of the world uh, or in different markets? I think, I think for the most part um, in my, in my experience, you can take a, you can take any of these systems and then sort of adapt it for any environment or any country across the world. Um, there are going to be, of course, different compliance um, requirements that you're going to have to meet, and that will be company as well as potentially uh, country dependent. Um, but I can't see where you couldn't take one CRM and, and then be able to um, adapt it to any country. Monica, your thoughts? You know, I would agree. I would think that if it's, if it's done from the perspective of the role, um, it can have universal or global applicability. I can see, you know, I can't speak for um, other areas, but I can tell you that the, across the world, MSLs sometimes do slightly different activities. For example, their role in, in um, medical education or scientific exchange in terms of presentations might be slightly different in Canada, specifically with accredited education programs. Um, I've been told that that is different than other parts of the world. So having some flexibility within the CRM to accommodate those regional differences across the world, I think is helpful, but the core mechanics of any CRM should allow you to be able to adapt to those unique nuances. Right, and I, th I think part of the ACMA's perspective is that uh, we are, you know, we want to set global standards um, for excellence within medical affairs, and the uh, there's an opportunity to uh, level set across teams that may be in different geographic uh, areas um, and across different functions. Uh, that's part of, you know, that's part of the foundation of the BCMAS program uh, is that. Uh, you know, the, the fundamentals of, of uh, good uh, medical affairs uh, professionalism uh, are universal. Um, at the same time, we try to reflect, you know, we use our um, a kind of a geo-based uh, uh, preparatory modules to um, reflect the reality on the ground, that there are differences in business practices, um, but not in the principles of being a good medical affairs professional. Yeah, no, I would agree. Uh, and within ACMA Engage, we actually have links between um, kind of the current activities and the trends that, you know, that each, each MSL may be experiencing in the field or each medical affairs team member is, is seeing at, at, at headquarters. Um, and it actually plugs into either, you know, it can be our, um, 
educational materials. It can be the company's edu educational materials. It can be a, a mix of the two. Um, but we hope that that is part of kind of the ongoing education and kind of leveling up um, within the CRM system. Uh, another question. Um, Monitoring MSL output and key performance indicators is, uh, is a, often a topic of discussion. Um, it seems that sometimes the insights that are generated from KO integration or interactions um, could be better integrated into MSL performance indicators. Um, what do you think of kind of how this, you know, insights and, and kind of higher level strategic thinking fits into MSL KPIs. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, this is a, when I was at Amgen, that was certainly uh, an age old question. And one thing that was always revisited. And, and I think most organizations struggle with what is the right key performance indicators to measure MSL productivity as well as impact. And I personally believe that including insights as a component of that is critically important. What the challenge is, especially as management, that when you've put in insights as a measure of success, what often ends up happening is you get a lot of information and not even well thought through information. So it becomes a, how many insights can I bring forward as opposed to what is truly the quality. So I think it's not just putting out insights and leaving it very ambiguous like that, Perhaps it's around, you know, in this course of a year, I'm just talking off the top of my head, but in the course of a year, which insights that were brought up by the MSL team as a whole, or as on a, even at an individual level, that led to some action? And what was the result of that action? So if you can link it in a more purposeful way, I think it's going to be more valuable and give you better quality uh, insights in the first place. And I think that was really where my focus of my talk was stems from having insights being part of a metric and then it feels like a number. So I'm just going to weigh in a little bit on this. And it, I think some, some people might look at a CRM as just, you know, a, a need to do, right? Like we always talk about with a CRM, good data in, good data out, bad data in, bad data out. And the better, you know, the information that you put into a CRM, the better you're going to get, you're going to be able to identify those uh, insights. But it's not, it's not the, the be all and the end all. So I think it's critical for an organization to be able to identify how they're going to use the information within a CRM. How are they going to be uh, analyze that data or allow access to that data uh, to be able to then use that for uh, from a perform performance um, measurement tool. Now, again, as, as Monica said, I think it's critical uh, that it, it is done, but that organization really has to identify and to be able to use it the most, you know, in the most optimal fashion. Gotcha. Okay. Um, we had a question come in about um, kind of the, the changes that we've seen, obviously with quarantine um, over the last six months or so. Uh, what, um, how do you see that kind of impacting people's ability to, I guess, get, get access to interact with um, their KOLs and how does CRM help, uh, help with that? So I think uh, I think I sort of talked uh, about that in in the uh, latter part of my presentation that being able to access the CRM from anywhere in the world I think one of the things that we've learned during this pandemic is it might not be business as usual but we can still do business um, when we are not able to access our um, customers or our accounts uh, live or face to face. Uh, there are now technologies, CRM being one, you know, the, the different video conferencing tools that, that we have, that we can still have these interactions and still have these 
um, he still have the ability to service our, our customers in a meaningful way. So um, I think at the end of the day, it's still doable. And maybe not to the same extent, but this might become our new normal. So, you know, uh, I think it's something that we have to incorporate into our practice moving forward. One thing that I can add, just even from talking with, um, in, at least in the Canadian context, clearly face-to-face -face engagements are not happening, um, but virtual con connectivity, even if it is a phone call, is certainly happening between MSLs and physicians. And it, while it might be reduced, I'm finding feedback from clients that I work with say that the interaction is still quite meaningful. If anything, however, the interactions with the physician customers or other customers tend to be shorter. So I think it comes down to that strategic thinking and knowing what are you trying to uncover and how do you maximize your time? And so it, it's, it's requiring people to think a little differently. So if people are using, for example, a metric of the duration of an MSL interaction with a customer as a barometer of success, meaning more is better, that may not always be true. So it might require training your team on how to ask the appropriate questions in the right manner to maximize the time and uncover insights of value through that process. And the CRM can help you mainly from the documentation of it and tracking who do we need to engage with to sort of pulse and keep that relationship alive, albeit through a, a, a very challenging circumstance. All right. Well, I know that we are coming up on our time and I want to uh, thank Monica and Tafik. You guys did a great job today. We really appreciate it. Um, appreciate everybody's involvement. And uh, if you have Further questions, if you're interested in ACMA Engage or any of the other uh, work that the ACMA is doing, please let us know. Um, we are you know, always looking for opportunities to advocate for medical affairs uh, in the larger healthcare ecosystem, and we'd love to talk to you. Um, I do wanna take a second and uh, let everyone know that in two weeks, we'll be having our next webinar, um, Effective KOL Identification uh, will be the topic and Jim Holmes from Alexion uh, will lead our discussion uh, in two weeks, uh, same time, 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, and we hope that you can be there. Thank you everyone very much. Wonderful. Stay safe. Thank you, Thank you, Adam, for having us. We appreciate it. Thank you, Adam.